Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast, the resource for transitional and experienced genealogists who want to create a successful business. I'm your host, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Here you'll learn from professionals all around the world who work in the field of genealogy. Are you ready to get started? Then let's get going. Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Today we head to North Carolina to get to know genealogist Craig Scott. Craig, welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Hello, how are you today? It's so wonderful to have you on the podcast. We have so much to talk about that we're just going to have to jump right in and try and get through as much as we can. And unfortunately, we need to go back to the beginning. I want you to, even though this is a more of a business podcast, I want you to talk about when you first got interested in genealogy, and then later we'll get to the convergence of when you started incorporating it into your work. With you, I want to start right back at the beginning. So can you take us back there now? Sure. Gladly. The year is 1968. I'm in high school, and I come across a piece of brown Scott hunting tartan, and I take this swatch to my mother and I say, I want you to make me a jack shirt out of this because my mother made most of my clothes when I was in high school. So she said, sure, do you have $60? And I said, $60? And she said, yeah, that's what tartan material is going to cost. We'll have to get it from Scotland. So I decide that, well, I have to prove that I belong to Clan Scott before I'm going to spend $60 on a jack shirt. And if you know what a jack shirt is, you're an old person too because they just don't exist anymore. So I started doing genealogy, and unfortunately, I was focusing so much on Scott and proving a connection to Clan Scott, which, by the way, I've never proved even after all these years, that I forgot to focus on the living because my great-grandmother was alive then. And I, I played checkers with her, and she cheated, but I didn't ask her the right questions because I wasn't focused on the right thing. And that, that's a problem with genealogy throughout your entire life. Sometimes you're focusing on the wrong thing. So I got started on this journey. I went off to college. I joined the Navy. I spent 28 years in the Navy. I did a lot of genealogy up until about 1985. It was not the focus of my life, but it was definitely in my life. And I loved every minute that I was able to spend. In 1969, we moved to Northern Virginia. We visited my grandmother for about a month. And she lived in Brentwood, Maryland, which was just off Rhode Island Avenue, which is a straight shot almost down to the archives. So I hopped on a bus, and on the 2nd of August, 1969, sometimes you remember dates when you're a genealogist, I went into the National Archives for the first time, and I touched a Civil War pension, and I looked on a Revolutionary War pension on the microfilm, and I couldn't read it, and I went and said, I can't read this, I really want to read it, and I got to touch a Revolutionary War pension, a real one, and I've only touched two of those in my life. So in 1969, I was like, if I wasn't hooked before, I was in hook, line, and sinker. There was nothing else I wanted to do in life other than be an Episcopal priest, which I never did, and become a genealogist, which I am. 50% is better than nothing. So I went and moved down this path. In 1985, I saw an advertisement for the National Genealogical Society. Imagine doing genealogy and not realizing that there were societies out there of people gathered together with a similar interest in genealogy. All I had encountered in all those years up to 1985 were obsessive compulsive people who stuck their head inside microfilm machines and generally were not very happy when you interrupted them. But I didn't realize that they were all organized. And I joined the National Genealogical Society, started working at running the library on Wednesday nights there for years and years and just got really involved. And what I learned was, is all those years I've been doing it wrong. I wasn't citing my sources at all. I mean, I had boxes and boxes and boxes of material, and I had notebooks and notebooks and notebooks of stuff without a single source citation in it. So I realized I was doing it all wrong, and I needed to learn how to do it right. I became the Clan Scott genealogist, and I was in about 1985, 1986, started publishing the Scott Genealogical Quarterly, and I was still doing it wrong. And I just couldn't deal with the fact that in my head, I didn't know how to do it right. So I started a journey of learning how to do it right. I became a, a basically a consummate researcher. 
I met Elizabeth Schoen Mills. I listened to everything she had to say, and I kept listening to everything she had to say. I purchased evidence, and I all of a sudden became a citation guy. You know, if you look in Evidence Explained, I'm in the acknowledgments for the citation guide among four what I'll call special people. But I just, you know, I kept going. And then I had to do things in order to finance my desire to continue to genealog- do genealogy. And that's how I became a publisher. And that's how I became a lecturer. And that's how I became an educator. And that's how I honestly believe that you have to be a researcher. You have to be a publisher. You have to be an author. You have to be a lecturer. You have to be an educator if you're going to do it right. That there's this like this stool with five legs. And if they don't all balance together, you're missing opportunity as a genealogist. What is it about doing all five of those things that you feel is so important? The most important thing that you can remember as a professional genealogist, the concept of short-term revenue and long-term revenue. Short-term revenue is that which you work for in the moment. Long-term revenue is that which you work for in anticipation of future remuneration, like royalties, like commissions, those kind of things. If you're a researcher alone, you're stuck in short-term revenue. If you don't work, you don't get paid. Whereas if you had long-term revenue, if you don't work, you actually get something. You might get a a commission off a a podcast or a a webinar or a book, a book royalty or those kind of things. Being a researcher alone is great. And lots of people make a living doing that, but they're always working. And life is so short, you shouldn't be always working. You should be enjoying yourself too. There has to be balance. Being an author, when you're authoring articles, generally those are short-term revenue. When you're authoring books, those are generally long-term revenue. Being a publisher, and by publisher, I mean publisher or self-publisher, that allows for the long-term revenue that authoring alone generally does not. Look, I'm one of the largest publishers around. Heritage Books is has 5,300 books in print. But I always say that if you can self-publish as a professional genealogist, you should do that because that improves your revenue stream. Because the difference between a royalty and the cost of production and a book, are they're significantly different. I think you should be an educator because, again, long-term revenue, there's an expectation that if you're the coordinator of a course once, you might become the coordinator of a course a second time. And it's not as much work to do it the second time as it was the first time. It's a lot of work to put all this stuff together. And if you don't, if you don't understand the concept of reuse, you are not working to your full potential. You have to understand reuse because time is the only real asset that you can't control. But the tricky thing with public speaking or delivering courses is that it takes so long to develop the course the creation time is greater than the duration of the class that it takes those multiple deliveries to recoup the investment that you made in your time. Well, that's a reality. But the reality that a lot of people miss is that you shouldn't be talking about something you don't know anything about anyway. If it's going to take you 150 hours to develop a hundred, uh, uh, excuse me, a one hour lecture, that isn't a lecture you should be developing. So there's that issue. Now, I always propose uh, lectures that I've never given before to national conferences because that forces me to learn and and I want to learn new things. I consider myself to be a bona fide know-it-all and a know-it-all is a person who has to be constantly learning in order to maintain that status. Lecturing is one of the ways that I maintain that status by learning new things. So I always propose generally one or two, but normally two lectures that I've never given before so that I have to develop them as part of the process. And that adds to my repertoire and they'll get used again. How do you feel about questions that the audience asks a speaker and how a speaker answers those questions? Should they always try to answer the question or should they say, look, I don't know the answer. Maybe you could go to this source and and see if you can find it. What's your take on that whole interplay between, you know, not necessarily you specifically, but just between the audience and and speakers? I I actually can only talk about me specifically. Um, (laughs) For I learned a long time ago that you that you never admit defeat. You never speak in negative terms in regards to an answer. You don't start with, I don't know this answer because it sets 
the people up for, well, he doesn't know. So what I generally do is I come up with what I believe to be the answer. I, I believe that you should always provide an answer whether you know the answer or not, and that you shouldn't precede your answer with something that's negative because that sets up in their minds that you don't know the answer to begin with. And you probably do know a piece of the answer. And so what I do is I try to construct guidance, try to give what I understand, what I think the answer might be. And when I finished, I'll say, but I don't know what the answer is. Does that sound like, a, does that sound good to you? I mean, I just made that all up. And it's often, I make a lot of stuff up that people agree with must be the answer. And some people come back to me and say, will say to me, that was the answer. And some people will say, well, that wasn't the answer, but in the process of doing what you told me to do, I found the answer. You know, it wasn't where you said it was, but it was somewhere else, but I came across it while I was doing what you told me to do. So, I mean, I love questions. I mean, I, there is not a question that I don't want to try to answer, but that's just my nature. In, in fact, you know me well from the perspective of lecturing. I start my lectures with questions, try to get in 15 minutes early, get everything set up. Most people get everything set up and stand around or somebody monopolizes their time. But I like to get right in, get questions, establish a mood with the group about, hey, this guy, this guy's good. He, I need to listen to this guy. And then you can start with your lecture and you've hit the ground running because everybody's paying attention to you. You've already got them laughing. You've already got them focused. They recognize your enthusiasm. They recognize your competency. And there are only three things a lecturer has to worry about. They have to worry about enthusiasm. They have to worry about presentation. And they have to worry about competency. And the most important one of those is enthusiasm. If you get them enthused about your subject before you even start about talking about it, I mean, half the battle is won. You, I mean, you have to have the necessary presentation skills so people understand what you're talking about. And, you know, but the issue for me is, are the slides really for the audience or are the slides really for you? as you give them the talk where you're actually talking to the slides, you know, and conveying what's on the slides to the audience and adding or subtracting from it. And you can teach anybody competence. Uh, competence is not hard to teach if they're learners, but enthusiasm, you can't teach enthusiasm because it comes across really poorly. And you can teach presentation. Some people go overboard with animations and, whiz bang stuff and i if that's good that's good but i'm just not into that it, because i would rather spend time preparing the lecture and thinking about it than trying to make the animations work craig i want to go back to 1973 because i have a feeling this has a direct impact on your career path talk to me about when you were in the u.s navy because i know that later on uh, in your genealogical career one of the things you become known for is military research. So can you talk about what you did in the Navy and what sort of impact it had on your trajectory? Well, when I joined the Navy, I was a conscientious objector without being a conscientious objector. Inside my head and heart, I was one, but publicly I wasn't. So the only thing I could be was a hospital corpsman. I became an ensign, eventually went out to Navy Medical Data Services Center where I, in Bethesda, Maryland, where I was the comptroller, then director of administration, then director of information systems, then director of program analysis, uh, all jobs that I loved. I retired in 1992. I worked for an air search firm for 18 months, and I loved the research, but I didn't like everything else that goes along with air search firms. So I had to do something. So I had two kids about to go into college, so I needed money, so I became a publisher. And all that led up to you know, where I am today. So tell me, which had a greater impact on your love of military records, touching that uh, Civil War pension record way back in Washington or being in the military for all those years? Definitely not being in the military for all those years. I mean, that wasn't even close. I, I, I have pestered Elizabeth Schoen Mills for, you know, nearly 30 years. So I talked to her about what I should do. And she told me that I should have a focus and that I should specialize in something. So I specialized in Navy records and in one year, I had one client, and it was like, sorry, I can't send my kids to college on one client a year, so I have to do something else. So I spread out 
to the other um, the other services. And I had a mentor, and that mentor was Marie Melchiori, and she basically would give me work that she didn't want to do. She was focused pretty much on Civil War alone in those days, and anytime anybody came to her with something other than Civil War, she'd send it my way. And she kept telling me that, you know, you need to get certified. And finally, one day she said, you know, unless you get certified, I'm not sending you any more work. So I had to run off and get certified, uh, basically, in order to continue to get this good stuff. Craig, when was that? What Give me context of what time period we're talking about. Between 85 and 90. So that's actually very early, you know, before oh, the yeah. before the big trend for becoming a CG started. Not that people weren't doing it, but it's much more commonly known now. I was I started out as a CGRS, so that's really I haven't thought about CGRS for a long time, and that's why I said CG. She didn't say I needed to become a CG. She said I needed to become a CGRS, which doesn't exist anymore. A certified genealogical records specialist. In those days, there were folks that focused really on records more than kinship, and they were CGRSs, and they really knew records better than anything anyone anywhere, and that basically was my job and. You're right. Touching the records themselves is what got me hooked. It wasn't anything that had happened before that got me hooked on the military. It was having to put two thirds kids through college and being in a position where I could go to the archives often and touch records that I, I have what I call Scott's law in regards to records. So if you if, if you take a Hollinger box and there's no dust on it, that's a new Hollinger box. And probably somebody has been in that recently. If the Hollinger box has dust on it, and you run your finger through it, and it just separates the dust. Well, that's that may be good. But if you run your finger over the top of the box, and the dust turns to oil underneath your finger, you've got a box that just nobody has touched in so long that probably everybody's forgotten what actually is in this box. And the series descriptions of, of at, at the high level don't really give you insight as to what's into it in an individual box. And even a description of what's inside that box may only be a partial description of what's inside that box. So you may be, you may find all kinds of weird stuff inside a box that you run your finger over and it turns to oil. I mean, that's true of any box, but I think the, the oily boxes are my favorite ones. No passion here, none whatsoever. <laughs> Let's talk about publishing. Why did you think that publishing would be a good thing and how did you get into that world? Well, again, it's the concept of short and long-term revenue. The best way to make money is to have other people work for you, okay? Working by yourself, you can only do X. But working with other people, they get X and you get a piece of their X. So when an author brings you a book, they're going to get money for publishing their book and you're – for authoring their book and you're going to get money for publishing their book. 20 years ago, this was a great idea. Today, I'm not sure that having 5,300 books in print, 1,200 authors, and all that kind of stuff, what I have today is such a great idea. I mean, it's still a good idea, but it's not the great idea it was when I decided to become a publisher. And the world has changed. There wasn't digital print-on-demand printing in those days. There was, you know, you made 500 books or 150 books or 300 books, but generally you made at least 100 books. If they were paper, and you made at least a seven hundred to a thousand, if they or even two thousand, if they were hardback. And I have pallets full of hardback books uh, that I made, you know, twenty, thirty years ago, back in the old days, that will still exist the day I die. Was there greater risk back in the day because you had to print so many books when a new title came out versus now, where you can print on demand? Oh, absolutely! In back. Back then, it was uh, a definitely an economic decision that you actually had to consider, well, how many of these am I going to sell? It, it was actually the year of the pre-pub. And, you know, if the pre-pub didn't work, then you didn't print the book because you didn't want to be stuck with all these books. I mean, the cost of warehouse space and the investment. But today, it's not as big a decision now today as to whether I want to publish a book or not. I mean, there are decisions I make, like I don't want to see a genealogy that's full of family group sheets. I don't want to see a genealogy that doesn't understand the concept of numbering. I mean, it is either uh, NGSQ or it is register. 
I don't want to publish a family genealogy that doesn't have sufficient references uh, to me feel like they actually referenced something that was actually real. But that doesn't mean I don't reprint old genealogies that don't meet that criteria. But the new stuff all meets that criteria. It's a 15 second decision now as to whether I'm going to whether I think it's my market or not. That's a, a bigger question than do am I willing to invest the money because the investment still exists. But it's not one that if you fail, it will strangle you for the rest of your life. You know, having a thousand copies of a book that you published 25 years ago still sitting on a skid, that's lost resource. And and it's just really a shame. Uh, And being able to sell that skid of books would just make my entire day. But, I mean, we also have Google Books, Archives.org, Haiti Trust, all of these organizations that are in the business of taking – a book and digitizing it. Well, if they take a book and digitize it and I have 500 copies of it sitting on the shelf, I'm the lamp, I'm the gas light, you know, in the electric age. And so I'm just stuck with that investment. And it wasn't a poor investment when I made it. It just became a poor investment because technology overcame what I was doing. Uh, much like what FamilySearch.org is doing in, in, in making material available digitally. Publishers thought when they sold a book to the library that somebody would have to stand for six hours and photocopy the book, and most people wouldn't be willing to spend six hours photocopying the book, and that really wasn't an issue. It didn't interfere with your marketing model, but now a a library can scan a book and pass it out, and there's no effort on the part of the individual now, and that really does impact a, a marketing model. You have to persevere and you have to just move forward, but there, there's going to be recognition at some point that what we've really done is undermine the base of authorship in America in that authors are not going to be compensated. They're going to be like musicians. They're not going to be compensated the way they should be for their work. We see a growing movement among libraries to reinvent themselves kind of along similar lines. We see libraries, instead of focusing on, you know, the place to come and get books and leave, they're now doing maker spaces. They're now lending out error quality control, water quality control devices. They're doing all these sort of radical different things in order to change with the times and stay relevant. Are there any trends within the publishing industry that show publishers evolving in a new way to sort of combat this transition that's being forced upon them because of technology? I've reinvented myself at least four times in the last 25 years. Every time we produce a book, we also produce it digitally. There's not much a publisher can do except keep up with technology. I mean, I can grouse about it all I want. I remember the gas lighters. And the telegraph operators replaced by the telephone. I mean, I'm just old. I'm old school. And I, and I do keep up, but it's not as much fun as it used to be. I don't know that there's much more that um, I can say about that. Publishing is not as much fun as it used to be, but it still exists. And people always do like books. And I, I, and I do know how to make them. It's just probably I don't know how to sell them anymore. But there is the issue is that there's a lot of people who don't know about heritage books. And don't know the kinds of things we have available. And, you know, my efforts are directed at uh, doing things like this so that people become aware of that heritage books exist. And we have lots of books that genealogists can use. In the world of newspapers and news, print news, TV news, we have seen across the same time period that you're describing that uh, Walter Cronkite was the source of information, so to speak. Everybody in America would tune in and get their information. Now what we see is kind of these silos where there are there's no one source of information anymore. There's millions, and people pick their one little source that they're going to choose from. Do you think that that sort of situation has happened in the world of genealogy as well? When I think of Everton's genealogical helper, maybe that was something similar that was the one source of information. And, and now that there's, there's no one source and there, there's many more of these silos that are going up where people are entering and learning about genealogy, becoming interested in family history, but there's, there's no one strong source. And the reason I mention this is because 
supporting industries like yours, it's much more helpful if you can tap into that, you know, main well of people coming into the field. And now we seem so broken up. I think we're always going to be broken up. What does it take to become a professional genealogist? All you have to do is say you're a professional genealogist. It doesn't take much more than that to become a professional genealogist. But that doesn't address the quality of professional genealogists that you are. It doesn't take much to hang out a shingle as a professional genealogist. It doesn't take much to hang out a shingle as a blogger. The issue in newspapers is going to be that what newspapers did was paid for investigative reporting. And there was a quality associated with that that doesn't exist today because everybody's an investigative reporter. And unfortunately, everybody has an agenda. We no longer live in a world of news. We live in a world of entertainment. I mean, I've always said I would get my entertainment from Fox News and my news from Jon Stewart. But And that's the way the world is really upside down now in that we lack the investigative reporting. Everybody is a newsman. Everybody's a reporter. Everybody has an iPhone or an Android that allows them to record a video. Everything is taken out of context now. Nothing is news. It's all entertainment. So we don't, necess- we don't have that problem necessarily in genealogy. Blogs are very entertaining. They're very informative. And there's a quality issue. You know what the good blogs are. You know what the bad blogs are. I don't pay any attention generally to blogs because I'm too busy looking at records. Do I want to look at the abstract or do I want to look at the record? I want to look at the record. And that's the same kind of thing. It's just the way of the world now. And and you're right. It's fragmented. And it, it will never again come together. Once Humpty Dumpty falls off the wall, it's very difficult to put all the pieces together again. As somebody who is, well, both of us are are very actively involved in the genealogical community, so we're very familiar with Elizabeth Schoen Mills and, you know, Judy Russell, names that are just common for us that roll off the tongue. Uh, When I go to give a talk at a, a local genealogical society and I'll pull the audience and say, oh, have you heard of so-and-so? Or are you familiar with this blog, you know, like the legal genealogist, something like that? And I'm always so stunned at how many people aren't familiar with people that we think are, you know, so familiar, such rock stars. The way this translates for me is everyone is your potential customer. And if they don't have, if these people in local genealogical societies don't have that familiarity tapping in with the genealogical community, How do you get them as a publisher, as your customer? Do you rely on Google search that they're going to be searching for something related to their ancestry and that's going to take them to your website? Or do you find another way to reach out to this large fragmented group of people so that they can find the books and resources that they need, which you have? The best method for acquiring a new customer is word of mouth. There, there is no better way. An ad does not work. I mean, an ad, t- 27 times you have to put an ad in a place before somebody even notices it. It's just very expensive, and the return on investment is just absolutely poor. Book reviews work very well as long as it targets the place that the book relates to. So that investment is worthwhile. Getting it in a national publication works also. Once somebody learns about you, then you can expand on their base, but you've got to get to the point where they learn about you. And it's just very difficult. This is a way that people learn about us. Heritage Books has a cruise and some people would rather cruise than, um, you know, relax a little while they're learning genealogy. So we get new people that way that don't know of us before. National conferences, unfortunately, selling to the national conference market is more difficult now than it was before because these people have 10, 15 years of knowing you and they're the same people. So you're not getting any new people. The new people you're getting are those from the local area. And then, so there's one third from the local area, one third within 500 miles, and then the 600 people or 700 people that always go because we're one great big happy family, right? I mean, (laughs) the only place we see each other is at conferences. But you already know about Heritage Books, so you're not a new customer that I have to worry about. So it's just – it's really a mess. 
because it, it's like driving down the street with uh, speakers blaring. You know, heritage books exist. Try heritage books and you know how well that will work. It just won't. Word of mouth is the best way. Quality product and word of mouth are the best way to get new customers. That's true as a professional genealogist also. You can advertise as a professional genealogist all you want, but the way you're going to get a client is because somebody referred them to you because they'd had a good experience with you. When somebody buys something from you, do you have sort of a like a loyalty program? I don't mean a loyalty program, but an email list or something so that you try to build a relationship with the customer so that they continue to keep coming back? Sure. We we have a Facebook page and we have a weekly newsletter and we invite them to join us. We we don't push it. They they've got to join us. We don't we don't force ourselves on them. With every package comes a catalog that we think focuses on what their research is, because we have currently have three different catalogs. One very old and then one that relates to colonial US and then one that relates to the South. And we have one on the north in process right now. But the problem with fifty three hundred books is we publish a book in order to create a catalog. It, that's how bad it is because our catalogs are like 200 pages. They're very dense ink-wise. They will put you to sleep in no <laughs> time at all. Uh, they're very good for at night when you just can't sleep. You know, Sit down with one of our catalogs and start reading, and I guarantee you, you'll be asleep in no time. So tell me about this weekly newsletter. I regret I haven't seen one or I haven't seen one in a while. Well, basically, we it's got a little bit of news in it that, might be of interest to somebody, you know, general kind of stuff, not necessarily related to something specifically genealogical in regards to like a conference or a meeting, things that we would think would attract people to wanting to get our newsletter. Our newsletter is like a page. It's not intrusive and it lists the new things that we publish. We publish about 30 to 40 books a month down from when we used to be publishing 70 or 80 books a month. Now, when I say that we publish that many books. These could be books that we once published and have gone out of print. We're bringing them back into print. They could be new titles. They could be something that we found that we think ought to be reprinted. So there are kind of three different kinds of things that we define as new, but these are the books that have just come back into print. Usually there are about 10 every week, 10 or 12. It's, It's out on Facebook. We used to have sales on Facebook, but nobody participated in them. It's just really strange. We offer a discount to members of APG who come in and use the appropriate APG code to purchase books, and very few APG members, of which there are thousands, they all buy books from us pretty much, but they don't apply their own discount code, which in a way I appreciate, but I would think that they'd want to apply the discount code. We have sales often, so. I noticed that you are are a director of the Association of Professional Genealogists. So let's talk about that a little bit. I don't think I've ever really talked to somebody who was a director. Can you give us a sense of, you know, what's involved with being a director, especially time-wise? What kind of commitment is there? Like, There are people listening who think maybe down in my career path, as I become more involved in the genealogical community, that becoming more involved within an organization like APG or even FGS or NGS would be more important. What kind of commitment is it time-wise and responsibility-wise, and what is it that compels you to do it? Well, I think I can answer the last first. What compels me to do it is there's two kinds of people in the world. There are givers and there are takers, and I really dislike takers. And being a giver is easy when you're involved in volunteer positions. And I have always agreed with the mission of the Association of Professional Genealogists because it lines up with my goal of life. My mission of life is to take people doing genealogy and to convert them into genealogists. And there's a decided difference between those two groups of people. If you're a hatch, match, and dispatch person, where all you care about is your pedigree, when they were born, when they married, when they died, you know, the hatch, match, dispatch, you know, it's just like, if that's all you care about, you have skinny ancestors, that's fine, but that's not being a genealogist. A genealogist is a person with fat ancestors who understands source citation, who understands narrative, who understands that there's more to a person than these three data elements. A genealogist is a person who tries to get inside the head of their ancestors. Why did they do that? 
why didn't they do this? Why did they do that? That's in my mind what APG is all about. And that's why I'm the longest serving director in APG. Every time I was eligible to serve, but once, I think, I've placed myself in nomination, or I didn't place myself, but they placed me in nomination and I got elected. In regards to the amount of time, it, it, it's a working board, so there is a lot of time involved. Time is very inconstant. Time is not specific. Parkinson's law is uh, the amount of work he spans to fill the amount of time available to do it in. And so if you understand that process, then you can reduce the amount of time that it takes to do something because you fill that space up with something else. So, I mean, if you've looked around, the most active people in genealogy are the people who are doing a lot. And you wonder, how can they do all those things? Well, they understand how to manage their time. All right, Craig, I think it's time to head into the lightning round. You ready for the lightning round? Have you ever known me not to be ready? (laughs) All right, let's get started. What was the one thing that you were most afraid of in starting your business? And interestingly enough, I'd love to hear your answer both from when you either started offering research services way back in the day or when you opened Heritage Books, but also now in terms of converting your business to meet the digital age. What's the one thing you were most afraid of? Nothing. I I mean, being afraid is a waste of time. You've heard me say many times that worry is the misguided use of imagination. I mean, the issue is not what am I afraid of. The issue is what what should I be doing? What do I do? Every genealogist should read Sun Tzu and try to apply the art of war to genealogy. What is one specific action listeners can take in the next 24 hours to help them transition into a genealogy career? Go to the ProGen website and read it. Take the quiz. Determine whether you are in a place in your life that you should take that 18 or 19 month course known as ProGen. There is nothing else you can do that will make you a better professional genealogist. Okay, and the website for that, for everyone listening, is progenstudy.org. So it's P R O G E N Study. Dot org. That's what Craig is talking about. Does that mean you already knew what my answer was going to be? No, I'm just that good, Craig. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. I knew that, <laughs> by the way. Do you have a productivity tool like Dropbox that you love and that you can share with our audience? I'm an old FileMaker Pro guy. All my databases are in FileMaker Pro. I much prefer it over Access because uh, it's more intuitive. But I also use Citrix ShareFile. So all of my resources are in Citrix ShareFile, which I pay to use, and I use it in my business. So all my employees, they have their own sections in ShareFile, and we share material back and forth. I have used Evernote. I don't use it much anymore because ShareFile works better for me. What is your preferred social media channel for connecting with your customers? We Almost all of our books are up on uh, Pinterest. Do you run the Pinterest account for Heritage Books, or do you hire a social media person for that? Because that's a lot of books to, um, ha- to have pictures no, of. No, um, Pinterest is a byproduct of our production process. So as part of our production process, customer service puts the cover up, puts a description up, and puts a link up as part of what we do. How many there people are, three... are there I, I, in Heritage Books altogether? Uh, if you count me, four. So four people are responsible for 1,200 authors and 5,300 books and constantly creating new work. We're pretty good at it. We know how to do that part. It's just selling them. We really don't know how to do anymore. If you can recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be? The book is called Understanding Revolutionary War and Invalid Pension Ledgers, 1818 to 1872, and the pension payment vouchers they represent. Most people, when they do pension research, just stop with the application files And this book takes you beyond the application files into the payments. If someone were interested in going into genealogical publishing today, what sort of advice would you give them about getting started? If we're talking about self-publishing, you just want to make sure that, one, when you start the book, you know what style sheets you're going to use so you don't change it six times before the very end because that's a lot of wasted effort. Um, You want to make sure that you... um, Understand what a PDF is because that's what most printers want and what the pieces are associated with with that PDF that they want. 
Uh, usually they're 600 DPI. Before you submit something for publication, uh, even if you're self-publishing, you should have at least two or three friends, one of them with some copy editing experience to look at the work before you actually print it or turn it into a publisher. I'm a firm believer in locality guides. I'm a firm believer in marriage records. I'm a firm believer in church records, probate, land, uh, those kind of things, uh, newspapers that don't exist anywhere else. Those things are all of interest to me. Give our audience one parting piece of advice and then tell us how we can get in contact with you. Uh, my last parting piece of advice is very self-serving. We have, a, we have a cruise that occurs every year. And we're leaving out of Galveston in September for seven days in Cozumel, Georgetown, and where else are we going? Falmouth in Jamaica. And you'll spend a week with David Wrencher, Paul Milner, Cindy Engel, Paula Stewart Warren, Mark Lowe, and Craig Scott. Can you imagine spending a solid week on a ship where they can't escape and listening to them for those people for a solid week? I mean, that's my advice. Take a vacation. Take a genealogy cruise with Heritage Books. And how can people get in touch with you? My email is crscott at heritagebooks.com. I'm very easy to find. The 800 number is on the Heritage Books website. I have another website called genealogybrickwall.com. That's my personal website. If you Google me, you'll find me. I'm not hiding. Craig Scott, thank you so much for coming on the Genealogy Professional Podcast today. My pleasure entirely. Wow, what a great interview with Craig Scott. We really need to thank him for being so open and honest and providing us with key insights about being a genealogy professional and running a genealogy-related business. We've covered so many topics in this short time, such as the importance of using citations in your research. We talked about short-term revenue versus long-term revenue. Craig also talked about the impact of enthusiasm when being a public speaker. Of course, he mentioned his own area of specialty, military records. It was interesting to hear how that led to his becoming a certified genealogist. Craig also gave us insights into the world of genealogical publishing, such as how to decide whether to print or publish a book, and he touched on the current trend of undermining authorship in America. He admitted that he knows how to make books, but he doesn't know how to sell them anymore. I'm sure that's a bit overstated, but his point is well taken. And finally, he talked about givers and takers and being a director for the Association of Professional Genealogists. Craig really gave us a lot to think about. Do me a favor and find a way to thank Craig for sharing and being so open. Send him an email and tell him what resonated with you most or go to his Heritage Books Facebook page and click like or sign up for the newsletter. In genealogy-related news, we are in the midst of institute season. GenFed just wrapped up, and next week, genealogists will gather for the Genealogical Research Institute of Pittsburgh, otherwise known as GRIP. On August 17th, the Northwest Genealogy Conference starts, and then at the end of summer, starting August 31st, the Federation of Genealogical Society's 2016 conference starts in Springfield, Illinois. One gathering that you might not be familiar with is GenStock. This is a very small gathering compared to the national conferences, and it is intended for professionals, people who are already working as professionals. GenStock is put on by Billy Fogarty and Matt McCormick. The goal is to provide an interactive opportunity to exchange ideas about the field of genealogy. The objective is to bring together skilled genealogists to explore new ideas and to dream, to encourage friendships and expand networks, to advance the field of genealogy, to examine questions relating to genealogy as a profession, to share knowledge about the field and its best practices, and to experience the sense of joy in genealogy and have fun. It takes place in Alpena, Michigan, starting the weekend of August 25th, before the FGS conference. To find out more, contact either Billy or Matt through the APG online directory, which you can find at apgen.org. If you'd like to become a supporter of the Genealogy Professional Podcast, head over to the website at the genealogyprofessional.com and click on the supporter button. And of course, ratings and reviews in both iTunes and Stitcher are always welcome. Some of you listened to the podcast through Stitcher. There was a little uh, hiccup there um, when 
the show wasn't being released through Stitcher, and that has been fixed. That little technical glitch has been fixed. So uh, you can reactivate it. Just search Stitcher for the Genealogy Professional Podcast, and you will find it again. So you can get back to Stitcher if you like. Uh, If you enjoy this free show and you'd like it to continue, please think about taking a minute out of your day to leave a review. For your action item this week, I'd like to tap into what Craig said about short-term revenue versus long-term revenue. I would rephrase long-term revenue as either passive income or residual income. This is a topic we've been discussing in depth in some of my mastermind groups this month. For your action item... I want you to think about the types of residual income that Craig mentioned, such as royalties from books and commissions from webinars. Try to brainstorm some more types of residual income. Here's one to get you started. Affiliate income, which is the linking to sites like Amazon.com. If people purchase through your link, then you get a small commission. Try to make as big a list as you possibly can. If you're stumped, go online and Google passive or residual income. Then take a look at your list and see which streams of income might be best for your situation and your business. When you're all done, leave a comment in the show's secret Facebook group. You can get to that by signing up for the Genealogy Professional podcast on the website at thegenealogyprofessional.com. That's it for this time. Until we meet again, keep improving your business skills and take at least one step to push your business forward. The Genealogy Professional Podcast is a production of Fieldstone Common Media, copyright 2016. Executive Producer, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Creative Producer, George Edwards. Production Assistant, Pam Wolos. Technical Director, Jean-Luc Pierre-Louis Jr.